In 1900, a child was born in Tibet. He would become a great Buddhist master. His name was Sechen Kongshul Rinpoche. In 1960, he died while imprisoned by the Chinese government. In 1973, he would be reborn in America. As me. seems fine with six. So say I'll take just this one, and I know that's like one of the main right. ones I want to use, right. and then lay that one down mm -hmm. so that I can put the other ones on top of that one. So I've got this one for this section, this one's my main one for the next section, this one's my main one for the next section, this right. one's my main one for the next section. Or you can take them if you want, or I can take them. If you're thinking I don't look like an enlightened Buddhist master, you're right. I couldn't think of a worse way to describe myself. Yeah, exactly. That's what the Tibetans, I think I called it, Sechen. They do this hot water with milk and honey. No, no, they no it's Sechen, my place. It's, yeah. I drink tea. Yeah, you do. You should drink it. Then you can go to Tibet and you can have tea there. Other than the fact that I make music videos, my life is pretty ordinary. I struggle with the responsibilities of being a parent. I'm separated from my wife, and I live from paycheck to paycheck. You're gonna see me tomorrow at my place. Give me a hug. Give me a hug, sweetie. Can you say I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> You're coming down to my house tomorrow to feed the fish. <laughs> I'm looking at some of the belongings of Setran Kongchul Rinpoche. They were recently delivered to me by a friend returning from a monastery in Nepal. These exquisite paintings were used in Buddhist initiations in Tibet for hundreds of years. Now, they sit in a box in my bedroom closet. In the 16th century, one in four Tibetans was a Buddhist monk or nun. It was during this golden age of Tibetan Buddhism that a tradition originated where upon the passing away of an enlightened Buddhist teacher, a young child would be recognized as their reincarnation. This child would assume leadership of their predecessor's monastery, as well as its surrounding villages. They called these children tulkus. Some became great leaders, others teachers, scholars, poets, and yogis. For hundreds of years, this tradition remained unchanged. In the 1970s, something interesting started happening. Tulkus were being discovered in the West. I know because I was one of them, recognized by Dilgo Kensei Rinpoche, a revered Buddhist master, during his visit to California in 1976. He informed my family he believed I was a tulku, the reincarnation of one of his peers who had died in Tibet, and that I should be enthroned immediately. So, at three years old, 
I was enthroned as a tulku in Berkeley, California. That's where my story begins. My name is Gesar Mukpo, and I live in Halifax, Nova Scotia. I've been a constant traveler, growing up in the United States, Canada, England, Germany, and even India. But before I tell you any more about myself, I'd like to take a look at another Tulku who grew up in Halifax, a close friend of mine, Dylan Henderson. Dylan was the first Caucasian Tulku to be discovered in the West. He was recognized in 1975 by the great teacher and scholar Chugyang Trungpa Rinpoche, my father. Dylan certainly has a unique story, that of a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Western child chosen by Tibetan monks as the reincarnation of their teacher. There's paparazzi over there. They're following you. Grammy? Oh, yes. Okay. And Grammy. The little picture over here, is that me or is that Jen? The Yoda picture. That's you. No, you look like you're 80 years old. You just... And the old man look? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is and your father looking and like a hippie geek? Uh, excuse me, there's your father looking like you. See that green van? We lived in that green van till Dylan was born. We met at a Jimi Hendrix concert. I was involved with the anti-war movement. I went south and I worked with Martin Luther King's group outside of Atlanta, Georgia. And his father was an activist. Yeah, I didn't even do that. Or my teeth. So my mother remember. became interested in Tibetan Buddhism. Summer of 75, went out to Boulder, Colorado, to Naropa Institute to do a program with uh, Trump Rinpoche. Walked up after a talk, um, sort of presented myself, and the next morning, or that night, Rinpoche said, uh, came back, he said, you want to talk to me? He said, be to my office in the morning. And uh, we went and met him. I pushed ahead of her and ran into the room to meet Rinpoche. And I felt at that time there was a, a real uh, connection. Um, it was like a, a loved one or, um, uh, uh, this may sound strange, but a, a parent. It had that, that sense. And I, I felt I didn't know exactly why I was connected to this person or anything like that. But I felt this connection. He had told my mother and people around, but he didn't make this general knowledge that I was uh, one of his teachers, but he didn't say who, um, and he left it at that. At that point, he wanted me to go to meet His Holiness Karmapa, who was going to be giving a, a black crown ceremony in Boulder. and I met His Holiness Karmapa, and I also had a very strong connection with him. And then he confirmed the recognition um, of me as a toku. And uh, at that point, he wanted me to come to Rumtek, where I would be enthroned and put in robes, and that would be the last you ever hear of me. Uh, but Trungpa Rinpoche said no. He said uh, he was born in the West for a reason, and he would undersee my education, and I would not be taken to room tech. Whatever I do, I need to study and practice. It's helping me to understand a lot of the problems that I had being a toku in the West and not having a form and a structure that tokus have maybe had in the East. I have a degree in anthropology and history, both very fascinating subjects. Diving is wonderful. For me, it's taken on a quality of being a meditation and action practice. 
because it really helps me work with my mind. I have to really be present and very aware of my surroundings. My father had made the same decision about my education. So Dylan and I have had to ponder the same question. If we weren't going to be brought up in the traditional way in a monastery, what does it even mean to be a tolku? Are there any charlatans teaching at Naropa this summer? Well, we have to have someone. <laughs> Otherwise, things are too clean. <laughs> and often, some of the charlatans are also uh, inspired students in the name of being teacher. So there's room for that. We have to grow up. And it had to become a American Buddhist who inspired and who has their understanding together can only work with the Western world is that uh, it is necessary to have um, that kind of situation. There is a point at the level that how far we can live on import. And there's some point that we better manufacture ourselves rather than borrowing from somebody else. Otherwise, you are an enormous debt. My father died in 1987 and took with him the answers to so many of my questions. So I head to Florida to see my mother, hear her recollections, and get her advice. I had a dream also before you were conceived, which was quite interesting. I was at Carmi Trailing with your father, and I dra in my dream, I went into the room next door, and there was a being there standing in the corner. It was a male being, and said to me in the dream, said, please, will you give me a place in your body? And I was pregnant within a couple of weeks, and we had been trying for a few months, so... I just think it was your eighth birthday party. It was we had a I costume party, and you were a samurai. It was a major. Everybody dressed up. Yeah, I remember the whole... I remember that outfit. I love that outfit. It was so oh, great. My mother was born in London in 1953 to an upper-class British family. Her father a barrister and her mother an opera singer. My father was born in a tent on the plains of Tibet. When he was 18 months old, a group of monks would show up at the tent door to declare him the reincarnation of their teacher. He would be raised in a monastery until he was 19, when he fled Tibet on the heels of the Chinese invasion. A brilliant mind, Four years after arriving in India, he would end up in England attending Oxford University on a Spalding scholarship. It was there that he and my mother met. I heard that he was going to be giving a talk at a rally for Tibetan liberation in London, and that was the first time I set eyes on him, and I felt an immediate and instant connection with him as soon as he walked onto the stage. So after that, I resolved to meet him. I didn't expect to have the kind of reaction that I had when I just set eyes on him. I felt like I'd known him for lifetimes. The first time I saw him, it uh, was immediate, instantaneous, incredible connection. And the rest is history. There were a lot of, you know, sort of hippie types, um, but generally really sort of the intelligentsia. Very, very smart people were attracted to him. And he was brilliant and wasn't threatened by that at all. So people who were very, very smart, most of them college educated, uh, who actually were really seeking something that would make more sense to them than what they'd been raised with. We spent some time together and he said to me, sometime I'd love to marry you. And I said to him, well, I'd like to marry you too. And then we discovered that January 1st, 1970, there'd been a law passed in Scotland 
that you could get married at 16 without your parents' consent. So on January the 3rd, 1970, I eloped with him to Edinburgh, where we got married, which was less than three months after my 16th birthday. My mother found out from the newspaper reporters that knocked on her door in London and said to her, we'd like to find out about your daughter who married the Tibetan monk. And she said, oh my God, oh my God, Tessa got married. And Tessa was my older sister, who at that time was 19. And they said, no, 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 it was Diana. And she fainted. All the kids were really excited that Diana had done a very cool thing. <laughs> I mean, he loved you very much. He believed in you, 100%. He was really concerned about your education and felt very strongly that you could grow up and become a very powerful Buddhist teacher and wanted to create the best environment um, for you to grow up and be educated to be able to go in that direction. If my father believed I could become a Buddhist teacher, yet didn't send me off to a Buddhist monastery, then what exactly did he have in mind? Being a tulku born in the West is an interesting predicament. There is no predetermined course, so it's impossible to tell whether you're on track or not. With that in mind, I head to New York City to meet another Western tulku, Ashoka, and to find out how he has dealt with this unusual circumstance. Ashoka and I have something else in common. Our mother, Ashoka, is my younger brother. In Tibet, it was not unusual for more than one tulku to be born into the same family. This is actually a painting of the previous incarnation of Commune Rinpoche. So, you know, I, I obviously say a lot that I have a very hard time with being a tulku, but yet I still display this tanka of my previous incarnations. So I don't know what that says, but... Why do you think they gave it to you? I think that they gave it to me, I'm sure, because they believe that I am the incarnation of their previous teacher, and that's what's so hard about it, you know? It wouldn't matter if I believed that I was the incarnation of Commune Rinpoche if I was teaching and if I had gone through all that training. I wouldn't have to worry so much about that because I'd actually be fulfilling that role that they need. When I was in Tibet, I mean, it was a really intense experience. I was enthroned, which is, you know, they're essentially their way of kind of sanctifying the recognition of the next incarnation of a Rinpoche. So, you know, another Lama will perform a ceremony where they sort of impart the blessings and the artifacts of the previous incarnation. And that's sort of the official, you know, stamp of approval that you are now, you know, hold that role and you hold that seat. At one point, a man who was supposedly the, or who was the younger brother of the previous commune Rinpoche was, you know, came up to me and he was a very old man and, and he was just tears streaming down his face. And, you know, you kind of feel a little bit like a deer in the headlights. What do you offer? To somebody so I, I try to just be there as much as I can and, and uh, I, I don't know you know I, I don't I don't know what the fuck <laughs> oh god I don't think 
then my role is to be a teacher, to be wearing the robes and be up on a, on a throne. And if that makes me a failed tulku, then maybe that's just my karma. But I still think I can be of some kind of benefit to somebody. And that's, I think, what being a Buddhist is about. I work at Human Rights Watch, which is a nonprofit organization that monitors uh, human rights conditions in different countries around the world. I work for the program that does prison conditions inside of the United States. So we really look at the situation for people who are incarcerated in America and, you know, we try to investigate situations where we feel like the standard of care for those prisoners isn't being met and we try to get certain policies changed that we think are not uh, beneficial for the rehabilitation of prisoners who are in jail. Hi, is this Kevin? Hi, Kevin, how you doing? This is Ashoka from Human Rights Watch. I'm just following up on a phone call that you gave to us the other day. I think if the police aren't, uh, you know, handling this appropriately, it might be worthwhile for you to think about getting some legal representation. Right. I mean, I think there's a lot of people like you who were not arrested for violent crimes and, and you know, who weren't uh, arrested for the types of crimes that typically people think are, you know, the crimes that people who are on the registry have committed. But then they're subject to the same kind of harassment and lack of employment and, you know, those kinds of problems that, that it sounds like you're, you're running across them. Okay. I've always really felt like helping people from the perspective of, you know, being an educated Westerner who came from like, you know, a pretty well-off family. It's important to give something back. I think I've at this point pretty much decided that whatever I do with my life, I want to have it be about at least trying to make the world a little bit of a better place because there's a lot of problems out there. What about the Tulkus who have actually lived up to the tremendous expectations placed on them? In my eyes, the living embodiment of this is my teacher, Zongsar Kensei Rinpoche, a renowned Buddhist master and filmmaker. So, in hopes of tracking him down, I get on a plane and travel to northern India. is the birthplace of Buddhism. 2,500 years ago, Siddhartha Gautama came into this world and eventually became one of the most influential figures in history. In 1959, during the Chinese invasion, many Tibetans fled to India, 
where the Indian government helped them establish Tibetan refugee settlements. One of these settlements, perched in the Himalayan foothills, was Beer. This was my father's first stop when he escaped to India almost 50 years ago. Today, Beer has grown into a thriving Tibetan community. Without looking back, we can never move forward. But without moving forward, we are simply stuck in the past. When I was a child, the idea of being a tulku seemed completely normal. By the time I hit my teens, I started to find the whole thing crazy and wondered if someone was playing some kind of joke on me. It wasn't unusual to have one of my father's students ask me for advice when I was only 11 or 12 years old. I've always felt I have some kind of obligation that people expected from me, but I could never figure out exactly what it was. And how could I fulfill these obligations if I'm just an ordinary person? I first met Zongsar Kensei Rinpoche, my teacher, when I was 16 years old and was immediately drawn to him. A few years later, instead of going to college, I went to India to study with him. Oh. <laughs> I've always valued his guidance and insight, and I'm hoping to spend some time with him. Apparently, I'm not the only one. generalization it's a uh, it's always changing okay so based on that I can't really go on talking everything about Vajra and Vajra but I thought maybe just um, see this is again another method the fact that I can't tell you <laughs> you understand really seriously Raised as a tulku in the traditional way, he underwent an extensive education. He is also a filmmaker whose debut film was well received at the Cannes Film Festival. I'm a very traditional, you know. There's so many new tulkus you must have met. Oh, God, there. Even, and there's actually many of them, they behave, you know. And even they behave. 
thousand of them, and this man who misbehave, I prefer him. This, uh, that's another thing I can tell you. We are still waiting. We are still waiting for him to do what he is supposed to do. <laughs> that's what I have to say. What do you think? Hmm? Tibetan lamas, especially high lamas like Karmapa in your case, or beginning to find tulkus in the West is very encouraging. Because this actually shows there is no sort of nepotism like, you know, that tulkus will always, you know, the Westerners, you, you know, you are all doomed, you know, you will never be a Buddhist incarnation. You understand what I'm saying? And this is a great thing. I think there should be more, you know, okay, if it was done properly. Uh, because, you know, from two points, from the reincarnation's point of view, reincarnation does not, you know, like the Tibetans don't end up becoming only Tibetans. And the you know, transmigration happens everywhere. In fact, some of the high lamas, for the benefit of sentient beings, they must reincarnate as a bird or a lizard. But we human beings don't want to really think in terms of enthroning a lizard as a, the seat holder of your big monastery, do you? Similarly, manifestation also. Wherever it benefits, wherever it benefits, wherever the reincarnation benefits, even as a lizard. Heave away, haul away yourself for a minute. Don't be afraid of the world if you ain't out there. Sometimes the sides they'll side with you and sometimes you sink right in it. Sometimes you lie, oh people die, it all comes with him. It all comes with him. I found out that there's this young Tolku named Wyatt, who's I think 23 or somewhere in that range. <clears throat> and my teacher, Zong Sarkense Rumshe, uh, I guess told him to study Tibetan or something like that. Uh, so yeah, I want to give a call, I have a cell phone number, I'm going to give him a call and see if uh, we can get together. And I'm not sure if I'm going to get in touch with him, but why not give it a shot? Maybe he's in class though. Hopefully he's in class. And sometimes you can buy a smile, more times you gotta win it. But you don't need to own the world to feel right there in it. So sit right there in it. Take your saddle back into the sunset, relax and soak right in it. It's a bumpy road, you'll win, you lose. So sit yourself down, enjoy it. <laughs> By the way, K Star, nice to meet you. Where are you from? San Francisco. I live in Canada now. So thanks for coming, man. Yeah. Let me buy you dinner. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like I was supposed to go to India when I was five. My father wanted to raise me in the West, and my mother didn't want to let me go halfway around the world. 
I ended up not going to India until just a year ago. I was recognized and enthroned when I was five years old by Chacha Tuguruji. I wasn't scared. I wasn't nervous. And it was very relaxed, but it was very intense. I think when you're a kid, it's easier for people to accept because you're so innocent. You're so fresh and you're not worried about their expectations. So it was easy for them to believe because it's just a boy. In uh, Catholic prep school, I was known as <laughs> the little Dalai Lama. When I was a kid, I would say things. You know, I remember you and me hanging out in this courtyard in such and such in Gompa, in such and such a time, in such and such a place in Tibet. For Chakta Dugu, being around him was like being with a grandfather. I mean, he sort of was always looking after me, disciplining me. He taught me Tibetan for a while. He taught me how to read Tibetan when I was little. He had me on the throne always next to him, and I'd have to read my texts during puja, all sorts of practices. Yeah, being and of course being around him was so... I loved being around him. I mean, how could I not? He was just so kind. I mean, he would give everything to me. Just always look at me with those eyes of... Just, uh, like, how do you say, how do, you know? When those eyes that you want everybody to look at you with, those eyes of, of just such care, I don't know. I don't know so many good words for it. I, that whole phase was until I was eight. After that, being around him, we didn't talk so much. I went to him one day, I think maybe in 2000, right before I was entering high school. And I was like, what, what should I do for me? And he's like, listen to your father. So after that, it, he sort of eased, I mean, he eased off a lot. And I changed after that. I don't know how to explain it. Some days I felt like, oh, maybe he doesn't care anymore. But then there was, you know, I still saw those eyes, of course. And I had taken an interest in llama dancing. I was so into it. Like, I was just into this thing. I mean, you put on this huge costume that weighs maybe 30 pounds and this mask that digs into your, to your head like, you know, you gotta put all these pads in it and it's like, you know, there's these huge teeth. And you wear a costume like that and it's, you know, you just spin around and jump up in the air and it's really exciting. And uh, I enjoyed it so much that when I, when I sat back down and looked up to him, he was like, I'd, I'd never seen him so content with me. I was always worried about his approval. And after that, it, it just, uh, maybe it was the whole, uh, I think it was just the whole ceremony. And he looked so just really happy, you know, happy about everything that had, that, that had gone. It was about the last, the last image I have of him. He died soon soon after that.
Without a doubt, the most remarkable part of being a tulku is the connections developed with teachers. In a way, my father was both my parent and my teacher, so losing him was devastating. It's when I'm in places like this, surrounded by our sacred culture, that I feel closest to him. There are only two known photographs of Sechen Kongshul Rinpoche. One taken in a Chinese photo studio. And the second, from his later years, taken by my teenaged father with an old box camera that he had borrowed. He developed and printed the picture at night in the main shrine room. I can only imagine how proud my father must have been when he developed his first picture and saw the face of his teacher appear. The entire Tulku tradition began with the second Karmapa more than 700 years ago. I'm sitting on the steps of Gyudo Monastery. We're about to interview His Holiness Organ Tinley Dorje, the 17th Karmapa. The 16th Karmapa recognized me when I was six years old as well, so this is the first time I'm meeting his reincarnation. The current Karmapa is the 17th in an unbroken line of Tulkus. At 14 years old, he made a daring escape from Tibet. Did you have any problems believing that you were a Tulku? Mm. Myself? Yeah, I think yeah. so. Uh... Uh... そうそうそう。Kamabalian, Jin The Karmapa is an incredibly important and beloved figure in the Tibetan community. He is considered a possible successor to the current Dalai Lama. Some people have even said that the Dalai Lama is grooming him for this job. Tibetan monasteries, you know, they used to be big they're they're a very big institution you know they 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 own a lot of properties they it's a very big thing in the social structure in tibet and um, wherever there is a money wherever there's a power there's a corruption and there's also a uh, fear there's also uh, you have to have a management you know so it could be for the purpose of managing a big institution, this happens to be a, you know, an answer 
in a society like Tibet, I mean, in the West, you elect, let's say, you elect uh, the, the big guy in the White House, but it does not really happen in places like in Tibet. So the way to, uh, way to continue the big guy in, uh, you know, White House happens to be like this. And it has its, its, its charm, you know, if it is done properly. I mean, like the President Dalai Lama, he, he holds one of the highest throne, I mean, the highest throne in Tibet, and he happens to be a child of a farmer, really a poor farmer. All of the Tolkus that I've met have a similar feeling of almost being lost or alone and, and no one they can talk to, and not really in a bad way. Uh, Ashoka, he said to me at one point, I don't really think about this stuff very much or talk about it. When you grow up as a Tulku in the West, you, you could sort of completely flip and not believe it at all or completely believe it and it can flip back and forth, you know, with one thought. And I really see Wyatt going through that. And it's interesting for me to realize, because I'm 34 now and Wyatt's 20, that he's actually looking to me sort of for advice or, you know, to sort of ask me what I've gone through and how I've dealt with it and realize that actually, you know, I have some kind of valuable experience that, you know, I could reassure him with. I mean, I, I, uh, I mean, I've always struggled with this kind of stuff. The whole idea of being a tulku is so sort of far-fetched and so out there that if you tell it to most people, they just think it's some, you know, complete mumbo-jumbo bullshit. And I think the idea of tulku is all right. It's just when you give someone a title. I mean, what do, what do you... You said something earlier, like, you tell someone they're supposed to be this person? Like, does that mean you're supposed to act like that person? Does that mean you're supposed to carry on whatever that person was doing? Is that person different than you? How much? Uh, it's just so strange, man. I mean, every, I mean, if you believe in reincarnation, then everybody's a tuku, you know. But the tukus that are recognized are supposed to be. Uh, what is it? An eighth-level bodhisattva who has power over karma, power over, mm, what is it, rebirth, power over, like, time, you know? Like, they can, they can completely defy all the laws of physical science because their mind is... so great, so precise. Yeah, I guess that is really been my experience is that I try to not think about it in those terms <laughs> because that's just too sort of unbelievable and try to understand it on a more personal level. So try. I guess I feel like when I read about that kind of stuff, it makes more sense to me because it's not just some... Uh -huh. Some like vague concept like uh -huh. there's an actual design There's a whole design to the way it works just like there's a whole design into the way the tree grows like there's certain there's certain causes that actually Have formed the tuku and what like it's a very important thing It's really important and the, what I'm curious to know is is it right to, to keep this tradition going in the West when there's no system for it to be held? 
Like, there's no system to bring up the Tuku. And there's no parents that are just going to give up their kid. I mean, there's no way someone's born in the West is just going to hop into a Tibetan Shedra and study, you know, 14 years. Like, it's, it's almost impossible. Yeah, I figured that out. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Can we get uh, two chai, please? Trying to have a strong grip on a so-called culture and tradition in many ways is not a wise thing. Buddhism has to transcend culture and tradition. You know all that. Uh, but of course, you know, we have to do it carefully because culture and traditions are like the means, it's like a medium. So we don't want to also sort of just toss it out overnight. It has to sort of slowly, you know, organically sort of change. And it will change, it has to. Buddha said all compounded things are impermanent, it will change. And thanks to the Western cynicism, skepticism, this is good. This, you know, like quest and sort of this habit and this arrogance or a pride of wanting to be objective ironically helps, you know, Buddhism because when Buddhism travels, I mean, there are, there's a small pocket of, you know, like completely, you know, like wishy-washy, mumbo-jumbo, you know, feeling this, vision that, you understand? But there's also great many Western Buddhists really going to Buddhism because there is a reason, and because it's a reason-oriented, you know, logic-oriented path, and this is good. This will be a guarantee. I have the biggest fear that, that I'll meet someone and then they'll know I'm a Tuku and then they'll go, they'll turn around and they'll be like, he's not a Tuku, you mm. gotta be kidding me. Because I have this huge, you know, welling of pride in, the, in that, and, in, you know, that's cut down, then I feel like I'm nothing, you know, which sucks. Like, I just want to be a normal guy. Well, you are, though. Yeah, 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 but not really. Are you sure? Well, I mean, if, if Chakratuku was right, you know, if, and even with the, with, even if it's not true, there's still the title there. I mean, it sounds like it's better to me to just sort of stop recognizing, stop giving titles and thrones, you know, in the West. Because as soon as you do that, it's, it just becomes political and like this whole social ladder. And you're, here, you're here on it and everybody looks up to you, but you have this horrible, overwhelming sense of self-doubt, yet you love being up there. I mean, that's what I'm going through a lot now. It's just trying to like let go of these expectations, let go of my doubt, let go of my feelings of fear and guilt, and realize that those are totally associated with my perception of, of how other people see me. I got a lot of everything from my dad, too, because he's really intense about this whole thing. Like, he's got big ideas, big ideas. And when you're, when you're a teenager and you're not, you know, too cool with your dad, like you're trying to be a rebel and shit, it just makes it all worse. At least it made it, it made it so much worse for me. I don't know. Didn't, I mean, when your father passed away, did you feel lost? Looking back now, I just realized that my dad had complete faith that I'd figure it out. Mm. <clears throat> and what all he needed to do was sort of like, give me his lesson of what it meant to be like a good human being and that I would figure things out on everything I need to figure out if I can just work from the basis of like, you know, making my life uh, healthy in some way or, you know, being sane. Why salt? No, I have... No, you salt the onion. No, I this is enough when you put...
When I was 15, my father passed away, and my mother decided it was time to send me to Nepal. She plucked me out of school and put me in the hands of Dilgo Kense Rinpoche, the Tibetan Lama who had recognized and enthroned me. It's been almost 19 years since I've been back to Nepal. So the, obviously, since Dilgo Kense Rinpoche was here, this was the first place that I actually spent any extended period of time with him. And uh, you know, he's an amazing person. He just, uh, you know, changed my life. When I first came here, um, <clears throat> I met Rob Jam Rinpoche, who's the head of this monastery, pretty much. And he knew I was just coming over from the West. I was 15 years old. So he had his television brought down to my house and a bunch of videotapes. And for the first three days, I just watched movies constantly. And then I came back, like, on the fourth day, and the VCR and television were going on. And uh, that's when I started studying Tibetan. First of all, I was born in a Buddhist family. Really, like big lamas here and there. And then at the age of like really young, I was basically shoved into, I might, I will not use the word force, but just basically. So there was no reference. There's no reference. This has all changed now. Shortly after arriving in Nepal, 
I met Ruben Derrickson. Born in Amsterdam in 1986, raised in Nepal and Bhutan, Ruben was recognized as a tulku when he was 11 years old. When I was young, um, I had memories of a previous life, and so my mother uh, was writing those down and kind of keeping a journal of what I was saying, and um, I described uh, the monastery um, that uh, I grew up in or that I taught in in my previous life, and um, some of the events that went on. And I mean, I have no, no memory of this whatsoever now, but so um, they had two Tibetan monk friends, or Buddhist, um, Bhutanese monk friends, and they said it was um, a big deal or something. And um, when the Dilko Kinsey Rinpoche was being coronated here, um, I was also recognized at that time. So I finished my um, school year at uh, Lincoln, which is the American school here in Kathmandu. And um, then I went to the monastery. Um, I can't say it wasn't completely voluntary because it I didn't really know what I was getting into, but I was also okay with going into the whole Buddhist thing because I had an image of these um, Buddhist monks as being holy and serene and all-knowing and wise and that they could really teach me the whole Buddhist, the whole Buddhist philosophy and everything. And Six days a week? Five days a week? Six days a week, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sunday was off. I can imagine three years of that kind of intensity for anyone, you know, is is asking a lot of someone to be able to take, let alone a young child who hadn't grown up in this kind of surroundings. Yeah, most people have no idea what goes down in a monastery. I mean, if you put 600 men together, what do you expect you're going to get? I mean, there are some people in the monastery who were good leaders, who were practicing every day, who really were people you could look up to. However, the majority of the cases... Um, the monastery there was basically a cesspool of jealousy, of gossip, of hate, of violence, and very un-Buddhist in a lot of ways. At least un-Buddhist in the sense that they preach one thing and then they turn around and do exactly the opposite. You have anything you find you would have found in a, in a Christian monastery, from homosexuality to child abuse to beatings. That's something that Zong Sarum Shea was saying, you know, when this person asked him the question about Bhutan in Sri Lanka. Like, there's a difference between Buddhism and Buddhists. And you better recognize that there's a difference between them or else you won't be able to make any sense out of it. Just because someone's uh, studying Buddhism does not mean that they represent the values of what it talks about. And, you know, do you consider yourself a Buddhist still? No. Now, yet still, as you told me, you will go back to Bhutan. Yeah, there's um, a ceremony that lasts about a week in Bhutan. Um, and I have been going back there every year for, um, for the one week to um, MC the ceremony. And, um, yeah, the reason I do that, see, I don't, I don't know if I believe in reincarnation or in all the Buddhist values, the traditional values. I really don't. But the reason I go back there is not because I say want to go back there every year, but more because it makes these people so incredibly happy. In Buddhism, there is concepts such as reincarnation, concepts such as tulku, all of that. But the institutionalized Turku system that we have in Tibetan, I don't think some, something like this exists originally in Buddhism. In the sutras and shastras, we never hear, we never read about, you know, Kashyapas or Mughalputras or Shariputras died and then, you know, the bunch of monks are trying to find their reincarnation. We have, we, we have, we don't know this kind of event. I mean, there are, okay, mentions of Ashwagosha, Jandagomi, who, reincarnate, who, who reincarnates. You understand? But the actual institution or the culture or the tradition of 
you know, trying to find a Turku and then enthroning them. And all of that is a bit of a Tibetan thing. Started much later, I feel. And now, I personally think that to hold that culture, institutionalized Turku, that culture is dying. It's not going to work anymore. And even if it, and if it doesn't work, I think it's almost for the better, because this Turku is going to, if, if the Tibetans are not careful, this Turku system is going to ruin Buddhism. And at the end of the day, Buddhism is more important than the Turku system. Who cares about Turku? What happens to them? So just dial? Yeah. Zero, zero, one. one. We're sorry, your call cannot be completed as dialed. Please check the number and dial again, or call your operator to help you. Turn and say that you believe in. I didn't really know what to say. Cause you've been around for such a long time I've grown the hope that you were gonna stay I realize there's nothing here to hold you It makes my words so much harder to say Yes, you are a man and your life belongs to you you have to make the best of things, no matter what you do. Remember, fights and people's wives are to be left alone. And if all else should fail, please remember. Hello, sons, hello. so good to hear you. Hello, hello. Where are you now and tell me how you've been? I hear you've done an awful lot of growing. Have you grown enough to handle what you're in? Hello, sons, so good to hear you. Good to hear you sound so in control It's too bad you couldn't make it home for Christmas How's the wife, married life, and little Nicole? Yes, you are a man and your life belongs to you You have to make the best of things no matter what you do Remember fights and people's wives are to be left alone And if all else should fail, please remember home I'm proud of being a Tulku, and despite my questions, there's something very special and dear in my life And I wouldn't change anything about this precious experience I value the connection to my teachers the Tibetan community, and my monastery. Hello, Rupshe. I'm so sorry. I didn't recognize you. Welcome back. Yes. See, I'm glad you made it. I wasn't sure if you'd be here. When I first came to Sechen Monastery in Nepal, the young abbot, Rapjam Rinpoche, helped me make the difficult transition. His kind heart and jovial nature made me feel at ease a world away from home. At 16, after spending a year in the monastery, I was feeling homesick and decided I didn't want to be there for the rest of my life. 
I called my mother, and she arranged for me to come back immediately. I've often wondered if I made the right decision. And I'm sure you've been from I'm meeting everyone here. How many months are there? Uh, almost three. Wow. But some are like out in the retreat of the So most of these people here are in the Shedra? Shedra and Tazan School. Whether I am a tulku or not is insignificant. I have a tremendous connection to this monastery and its people, a tremendous connection with my father and his heritage. They will always be a part of who I am, no matter what I do. I'll never know for sure what my father had in mind. There will always be a certain ambiguity. Still, I can't help but feel that he knew I would figure it out for myself. Having spent time with these tulkus, I found we have much in common. There is no certain path for any of us other than the path of self-discovery. It can be a lonely path, but in the end, it is the only way that anything meaningful is born. So I can't think of a better way to honor this situation than to simply go home and share my story with my daughter. Perhaps someday she will keep this incredible wisdom that is our birthright alive. Any of these teachers at the end of their life are completely happy with the experience of what they've had and what they've been doing. And, you know, I've never heard of like a Buddhist renouncing their faith at death. I think my ride is here. Sometimes the sides they'll side with you and sometimes you sink right in it. Sometimes you lie, oh people die, it all comes within it. It all comes within it. So heave away, haul away yourself for a minute. Don't be afraid of the world if you ain't out there in it. If you ain't out there in it. Sometimes you can buy a smile, more times you gotta win it. But you don't need to own the world to fit right there in it. So sit right there in it. Take your saddle back into the sunset, relax and soak right in it. It's a bumpy road, you'll win, you lose. So sit yourself down, enjoy it. Sit down and enjoy it. And heave away, haul away yourself for a minute. Don't be afraid of the world if you ain't out there in it. You ain't out there in it. 